feet. My experience as a singer, songwriter, recording and performing artist as part of this all-female trio at the turn of the millennium is the why of my becoming a creative industries consultant. Being thrust into the midst of our local music industry, we had to learn quickly how to maneuver, how to mind our business. I began to observe the moves of our most successful and least successful acts. What did they do? What did they not do? I recognized there was one major difference between the successful acts and those that were, well, not. I identified what I still think today is a critical gap to be filled in order to be successful in the music business. Never one thing and seldom one person can make for a success. Marie Dressler. This quote is true for all of life and specifically applicable to the music industry where collaboration and connection are critical. The people an entrepreneur hires de de determines the heights to which the company can climb or the depths to which it will plunge. This is an essential of entrepreneurship and small business management. Historically, Human resource management in our music industry has been based on the notions of friends and family and word is born. <laughs> I'm sure that we can all think of some examples, if not in our own enterprises, certainly in others. But that brand of HR comes with its own challenges. People can be too close for comfort. They can be trusted, but not trained. And that could lead to a threat to trade. To counter these challenges, you want to ensure that you have the right team working with and for you. So I'd like to leave you with a takeaway, a framework for developing a winning team. T-E-A-M. Let's go. T, you want to make sure that you have two or more people with the time and the talent necessary for the undertaking. E, you want to ensure that these people have the expertise and the experience that is required. You want to make sure that they're operating with efficiency and excellence. You want to be assured that your team members are able, available, that they are accessible, accountable, and adaptable. And lastly, M, you want to make sure that they can manage, that they know the market, that they can operate in the market, and that they can make money for you. It's after all the music business. We're here to make money. <laughs> so in assembling your team, it's important to ensure that all the elements of your enterprise's value chain are adequately addressed and assigned the appropriate human resource. Generally, an enterprise in the music industry's value chain would consist of the content creation, so you think tank, production and editing, research and development, marketing and promotion, raising awareness, distribution, driving sales, consumption, user experience. Finding and assembling and keeping the right team is essential to an enterprise's success because 80% of employee turnover is caused by bad hiring decisions. So you want to be sure that you choose the right horse for the right course. Commit to finding and keeping the best talent. A players, hire A players. Don't be afraid to hire someone that's smarter than you or more talented than you. Conduct the necessary background checks, verify and validate before you contract and collaborate. Values outlive business models. So says Gary Hamill. So keep that in mind as you engage team members, as you build relationships, as you develop your business culture, because that culture affects everyone and everything you engage with, including your bottom line. Remember that your team is a reflection of you. They are representing you as they do business and therefore they should always be on brand and seek the enterprise's interests. I share on this and many other topics relative to developing business strategies for arts, cultural, and creative enterprises as part of the ACAM postgraduate diploma course offered by UE St. Augustine. 
My ultimate mission is to demystify creative industries for teams ready for trade so that our creatives can commercialize their creative capital towards creating generational wealth. Connect with me on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and stay tuned for demystifier.com. Hi, Mr. Welcome. Hello. Thank you so much. All right. For those no problem. So for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about who Nisa is. What does Nisa do? Okay, a very little bit. Well, I I am an artist, a mom, a sister, a foodie, a wiggy. I love, I love, love, love music, love food, love my son, love God. And I've been doing music for the past, what, almost my entire life, you know, so... I'm guessing that's exactly why I'm here because of the music part of myself, you know. So that's that's a little bit in a nutshell. Nice. Now this is woman in music, right? And this is woman in music. Rapid fire questions. Right. Are you ready? Rapid. All right. Ready. Yes. <laughs> All right. So first one. What was your first introduction into the world of music? I grew up around music, so uh, my first introduction was my mom and my dad. My mom was a singer, my dad was a keyboardist. So it started, it started way back then. Nice, next one. Who has been your biggest influence thus far? Wow. <laughs> Shaka Khan. Nice. Tell us about one highlight of your career. Winning the Gospel Music Awards female for two years in a row. That, you know they say you can't plan things? Yeah. Yeah, I want one. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Did you always want the career you have? If not, what did you want to be? No, I always wanted to be where I am. <laughs> if you can have a superpower, what would that be? To know people's thoughts. If you were a musical instrument, which would it be? Guitar. Okay. <laughs> How long have you had a career in music? I started doing music professionally um, right after I left school, so probably about 16, 17 years old. Yeah, and I, I, I embarked on the brand in 2010. Nice, nice. What's the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to you in public? I am always so precious. Okay, when I was going to school, two girls who I thought were my best friends, they took like it had little grass at the side of the road with pick on it. And for some mm -hmm. strange reason, they decided that they were going to pick on me that day and just hit hit me with all them pick -a. And it was so embarrassing because we had real people around. And I I was like laughing, but at the same time saying, what DJ, what are you doing? I, I don't know, for me, it was just- That is very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Name a challenge that you encountered in the industry. How did you overcome it? I still, I think I'm still overcoming it and it's just mm. being a woman in it. You know, I feel like mm. we do get some recognition, but I, I don't know. I feel like the men just have something that we don't, which is fine, but I'm just not sure if the balance in terms of the thought pattern and process with regard to women and respecting our craft outside of us having bodies that people mm. like to look at. Um, as hmm. being the, the most important thing. I think for me, that remains one of the challenge challenges. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah. Okay, if money were no object, money wasn't a problem, hmm. what would you do with your life? I love to help. I, I, I wish I could help more people just with getting food to eat. I don't know mm. what it would look like, but I just feel like that is on the top of my list for like, if I had money, I would help people get food and then I would mm. have a lot of weights. <laughs> so like a Nisa soup kitchen kind of vibe of feeling, right? Yeah. Yeah. What is one important skill you think that everyone should have and why? Being able to read, even if you're not there yet, at least try because it kind of, I believe it's very, very important, especially in the world of business, because if you don't know, especially in the business that I am in, you need to be able to understand what people are presenting to you, you know? So I think it's important that we learn how to read and comprehend what we're reading. Yeah, for sure. What aspect of your daily routine do you look forward to the most? Going back to sleep. Yes. 
What advice would you give to aspiring female artists, musicians, etc.? Just women who are coming up in the industry. What is the piece of advice you would give to them? Be more sincere, collaborate more sincerely, and not be our own ghost. Hmm. What would you say is the hardest part of your job? Not being able to be human. Hmm. How do you cope with work-related stress, anxiety, those sorts of feelings? Well, as no stranger, there's no secret, sorry, I've battled anxiety and depression severely over the last couple of years. And to me, you have to really want to overcome it. Sometimes you don't choose how you feel when you wake up. For me, I have, I have routines. I, I would buy a flower for myself and just have it there. Or I have a really nice doll called Coco Bell. She's just beautiful. I just, just surround yourself with things that are going to help you mentally. Sometimes trying to get people to understand it's not it, but accepting where you are and understanding that you can't get out of that rut. You know, it's, it's a process. So don't, don't be hard on yourself if you're facing that type of thing. Just journey, but honestly journey. Yeah, for sure. What is your favorite part of the job? The stage. Once the mic is good, um, the possibilities are crazy beautiful. That's my home stage. Tell us one goal that you still want to achieve. You've achieved a lot, but what is something that you're still working towards? I want. As you can share. I want to do an album. I've never ever done an album. So yeah. Wow. Okay. If you could go back in time, is there anything that you would do differently? Work harder sooner. Okay. And the last one, this is number 20. Three words that you would tell your younger self if you could. Oh, three words? Yeah. Run, go for it. Well, okay. go for it. But yeah, yeah, um, we'll take it out. And don't give up. Thank you very much, Nista. This was Rapid Fire, Woman in Music. That was You're awesome. Dope. That was real fun. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Tiana Chandler, and I am a singer, stage manager, and theater producer. Now, my origin story as a performer is a familiar one. I started at a very young age in church choirs, and as I got older, I was fortunate to attend schools that had thriving music communities. I was able to find my voice and was exposed to music in so many ways, including my very first musical theatre experience. I tried to use every small opportunity to make a big impact and even found myself always trying to help with scheduling and organising choirs and groups I was in a skill which would become handy in years later, in 2012, when I stumbled into my first experience as a stage manager. It was like I spent my whole life pursuing the spotlight on stage, that I took for granted all the hard work that happens behind the scenes. So I began to explore life in the wings through stage management, lighting design, and eventually theatrical production. By the time I graduated with my bachelor's in management studies in 2014, I had the realization that there were so many more talented people, just like me, who were not afforded many opportunities to be seen. Using my knowledge of theatre production combined with my tertiary education, I founded Chandelier Productions in 2015 with the mission to provide opportunities for young performers and other creatives behind the scenes to be seen and share their talent with Trinidad and Tobago and the world. Seven years later, Chandelier Productions boasts of nine shows, one flagship concert series, three featured artist concerts, over a dozen technical and production crew members across our shows, and over 80 vocalists and musicians have crossed our stages. Our shows include Theatre Night Out, which was our inaugural concert presented at Queen's Hall in 2015. A Breath of Fresh Air featuring musical direction and the premiere of an original composition and other arrangements by Michael Hudlin. The Christmas Things We Do, which featured the vocal styles of San Fernando's premier mezzo-soprano, 
Michelle Dorridge and friends in concert. Theatre Night Out 2, the second edition of the Chandelier Productions flagship concert which again brought musical theatre favourites to the stage with choreography by Trevon Pajou and a special preview performance of AIDA presented by the Presentation College Mixed Choir. Fresh, which was a feature concert for Kevin Humphrey and it was his first full-length solo concert all backed by a live band. And on Earth Peace, Chandelier Productions' very first Christmas concert, and this was dedicated to spreading Christmas cheer during the pandemic, all while bringing live performers back to the stage and high quality performances back to our audiences. For Faith and Music, the final concert recital of musical director Michael Hudlin, as he completed his master's degree in conducting from the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. The Pursuit of Greatness, an ambitious staging of George Friedrich Handel's Dixie Dominus, and this brought a classical music experience to local audiences, all under the musical direction of Michael Hudlin. Theatre Night Out 3, Une Petite Nuit, our most recent production and the third edition of our flagship concert series, featured an original script by Janine Charles Ferry stage direction by Chanel Canel, musical direction by Michael Hudlin, and choreography by Tristan Wallace with directing consultation by Trevon Jagmohan. With three staged editions since its inception, Theatre Night Out continues to evolve with every edition while bringing the magic of musical theatre to the stages in Trinidad and Tobago. As a young professional, it is important to find a team you can trust. Over the past two years, Chandelier Productions has sought to fulfill its mission through collaborations with other small companies within the creative sector. We have put together an all-star team of young creatives to fulfill all of the technical and production needs of the company, including Michael Hudlin as musical director, Janine Charles Ferre of Black Color Creative, Lighting designer Andrew Enil of Kinley Lighting Designs, videographer Dennis McNichols of Denethy, audio engineer Sanjeev Gayadeen of Simplicity Sound Systems, assistant stage manager Jonathan Thatcher, and set and graphic designer Amara Manikchan Brown. Being authentic and original is always a challenge, but working with the right team allows you to share ideas and become inspired as you support each other on the road to success. While I started out my journey searching for the spotlight on stage, it allowed me to develop the talents that I didn't know I had to shine a light on other young creatives and musicians in our beautiful Twin Island Republic. Thank you all for listening and thank you to Music TT for having me here in the Women in Music segment. I hope you all continue to enjoy the Reverb Experience hosted by Music TT. Hello, and thank you for joining us, Crystal. So thank you for being Hello. part. Of, thank you for being part of the Woman in Music panel. So we're gonna just jump right into the deep end. We're going to do 20 questions and uh, you're just gonna rapid fire it let's see how okay. best i can do this <laughs> okay so let's start what was your first introduction to the world of music all right my first introduction to the world of music was church and having my own my own bucket group wow okay <laughs> tell us one <laughs> highlight of your career Whew. this might have me thinking a little bit but i'm just off the top of my head I'll say the highlight of my career is meeting Michael Jackson. You know, having a, he was going to start a store, meeting Michael Jackson. And where are you working now? I am working with Cirque du Soleil. That's exciting. If you didn't become a musician, what would you be? Hmm. Honestly, I would have been the shortest flight attendant. That's all I have to say. <laughs> oh my Lord. What, what is Regen Project about? Region Project is a music educational program created for 
of bringing of youths and communities using music all right and everything to do with with the music and the arts is what we try to educate and bring them you know in a professional setting and and mold them what does regen stand for regen stands for reform generation the reform generation project okay and why that name again the whole idea of the program was designed to you know just transform the mind of where youths are where music is concerned and of course we know the situations that we deal with in trinidad involving you know crime etc but music is a powerful medium and i wanted to use that medium to just have that transformation and that reformation is just to bring about change and of course we know reform means change and it means changing the next generation yeah true music love it how many instruments do you play <laughs> well i play drums and i try to play bass <laughs> although some people will say no she's play bass i keep it real <laughs> try to keep it real I could Drum. kind of play this. Drums is Drums is my love. Drums right. is my love. That's my love. What is the weirdest question or funniest question you've ever been asked in an interview? I'll try to make this I'll try to make this short. Hmm. So first of all, it's it's on you know, it's very, being outside working for the company that I work for, it's unrealistic to them to see somebody from the Caribbean in it. But they have they have cliches of what they think the Caribbean is, and I had one interviewer ask me, "Does Trinidad have internet?" Literally not too long ago, too. This question was asked to me. I was like, "Wow!" But again, it's stereotypes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what is the best project you've ever worked on? To be honest, the best project I've ever worked on is one of well it's tough because obviously the best project that i've ever worked on is the region project but i i can't i can't not mention the creation of at least two of silk shows and that whole creative process and the whole artistic direction that was given yeah 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 that is awesome it's a lot <laughs> That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what is one of your music industry pet peeves? Oh, <laughs> one of my pet peeves in the music industry is the unprofessional approach that some musicians and artists have to what is claimed to be, in their opinion, professional. The, pre the presentation of, of the music, the how they present their bio, how they present themselves, how, you know, just, <laughs> yeah. I could go on and on. Let me stay there. Okay. So <laughs> if you were a musical <laughs> instrument, what would it be? Ooh, what a question. If it was a musical instrument, I wouldn't say drums because people tend to think drums will uh, could represent boisterous, wild, loud. I'll say sax. Sax is kind of like the sexy instrument, you know, cool, easygoing to people. I'll say sax. Never mind when you're now learning saxes boost up your lip and all of that i went through all of that oh it's wow oh wow <laughs> right oh my goodness what is your favorite food <sighs> anybody who know me and watching this will answer for me and i will always say pillow <laughs> <laughs> pillow is my favorite food i know yes you come from sure everybody say oh it might be roti yes second pillow first <laughs> hands down with or without coleslaw <laughs> or oh no 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 with coleslaw and a slice of avocado all right so where in the world are you now right now i am in anchorage alaska where there is no night time no dark nights i should say yeah anchorage alaska oh wow i think i yeah. stunned by the, the, the yeah. new dark night time oh wow yeah it's it's a new world for me it's my first time experiencing that in ever 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 it's yeah, I'm still getting used to that. So besides that, what would you say is the hardest part of your job? You know what? I'm, I'm happy this question comes right after that because the hardest part of my job is readjusting. Readjusting to cultures, readjusting to time, readjusting to schedules, and also readjusting to the cultural differences of the team that you might be in or a part of. What is the favorite part of your job? Ooh, 
favorite part of my job is just meeting new people, meeting people from different countries, different parts of the world, and learning their culture as well. That's, that's, that's me. If you know me, and everybody knows that, that's what I'm about. Meeting people and understanding their culture. Nice. <laughs> Tell us one goal that you still want to achieve. Hmm. I mean, the typical answer would be you still want to achieve, you know, being one of the greatest, the richest in the world. But one of the one of these most serious things that I really want to make sure and achieve is that the vision that I have for Region Project is huge. And I want to be able to fulfill that in its true potential. That's where my heart is. Nice. I, I, I felt that response. How do you cope <laughs> with it? It's stress or anxiety. Almost every time I have to perform, I get anxiety. How do I cope? My God. Just a lot of meditation and, and, and prayer. With all things, prayer prayer covers it all for me. That's my go-to. I, I always try to channel my, my attention to the maker above and allow him to be my calm, be my peace. I love that response. God first. Always, and always. Lastly, what adv advice would you give to other women wanting to get into music? This might go longer than I, I should, but I'll say just hone your craft and don't be afraid. Don't be scared to reach out for help, assistance, reach out to the right people that could also guide you properly. Yeah, and not just gas, gas you on. You know, it have a lot of people gassing you up. You know, reach out to people who could keep it real and propel you forward and guide you into the, the, the fullness of your potential. Yeah, and make sure, and most importantly, get the right musical background, backing, schooling, etc. Yeah, big up to UTT right in Trinidad. You don't need to go far, they're doing a great job there. And uh, you could always seek, uh, you know, information from schools outside as well. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Stay warm. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, I'm trying. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye. I'm Janelle Franton, co-founder and CEO of Mark Made Group Limited. And today I'm here to speak to you about the power of music. I already hear someone's thoughts out there who's watching saying, oh my God, that's so cliche. Yeah, well, pause with your judgment, Judy, and you too, Nancy, because the power I'm talking about is on the world-saving maximum level that is Stranger Things. You all see what I did there? Max, Imam. And well, if you don't know about or haven't seen Stranger Things, maybe because you aren't into a weird sci-fi horror drama vibe, but you happen to belong to an era in the 1900s, you'd likely still know this song from this scene. P.S. Spoiler alert. Close your eyes if it matters, or if you can't stomach gross scenes. Yeah, I know, epic. But even if you don't think so, you might have still been seeing all the media fuss about Kate Bush's resurgence, dominating the charts with running up that hill almost four decades after its release. I mean, seriously, when season four of Stranger Things debuted on May 27th, who would have expected that by early June, this song would have charted as the most streamed song in the world, also claiming the number one spot on the UK charts, and then by mid-June, topping the Billboard Global 200. In fact, Fortune.com reported as of July 7th, Kate had made US $2.3 million, or in our local currency, around TT $15.5 million in just over one month. Two things happen when I encounter truly fantastic stories like these. One, I begin to question what the hell I'm doing with my life, but more importantly, two, I take a look under the hood. Because while Kate may be getting some unexpected boomer mileage, I want to know if she's also getting the money. And what makes her case so compelling and confusing is that she not only wrote and produced Running Up That Hill, hence owning the copyright, but she also owns 100% of her masters under her independent label, Noble and Bright. Kate, 
you might be noble, but today I want to focus on the fact that you're real, real bright. So bright, in fact, that the only third party that seems to be in play is Warner Music Group through a distribution deal for the song. And so, current industry estimates have claimed Kate has an 80% retention of the royalties made from running up that hill, mileage and money. So not only did Kate Bush save Max's life in one of the most powerful moving scenes in all of Stranger Things, but for her noble gesture, she can also now sponsor the music industry of a small twin island republic for a year or two if she felt like it tomorrow. Hashtag shameless plug. But in all these reports, there is a missing link to the greater appeal I'd like to make to our woman within the music industry. See, Kate as the master owning business genius is superbly rare. But you want to know what's not being spoken of enough in her case that's also way too rare? A female songwriter and producer existing on the billboard charts. By now it should be annoyingly obvious that I just love quoting stats as the not so undercover nerd I am. So here are some quick ones taken directly from the annual report last year of the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative based on a study of the Billboard Hot 100 year end list from 2012 to 2020. Only 21.6% of artists in that list were women. Only 12.6% of the songwriters were women. But the most damning of them all, only 2.6% of the producers were women. And while I believe these stats speak for themselves, I've still got a few more seconds so I'll keep talking. It's easy to celebrate the success of Kate as a master owning boomer, making a mad comeback and owning the TikTok space. It's harder to see how precious it is that she wrote and produced that song. Quick check, how many of the producers you know and work with are women? Is it that we don't see the power of claiming our place in this space? Or is it that we have to deal with some discouraging and unfair biases against us being there? I don't have have those answers for you as conveniently my time is up but today i'd like to invite more women to explore these male dominated production and songwriting spaces maybe because i am selfishly but genuinely intrigued to know what our global music could sound like through you but mostly because i'm a fan of equitable spaces so, if you could take this as a sign of the permission you never needed, I can sleep well tonight knowing that you listening to me drone on for five minutes was worth it. Thanks for that, by the way. I'm here to kick you off the bench and onto the playing field anytime. Hi, Fia. Thank you so much for joining us. For those who don't know, tell us a bit about the Fia. Well, my name is Afia Cunningham. I am the CEO of Aspire Agency. Besides being a CEO of a music company, I also have a nine to five. But more focusing on Aspire Agency, I see more about artist management and music business education. So I do education by sharing valuable information about the music business and via consultation. Nice. Okay. So what was your first introduction to the world of music? In the world of music, my introduction would definitely have to be becoming a member of the Port of Spain Pathfinder Band, which is a band that is associated with the Pathfinder Club that is associated with my church. And after seeing the band come to my church, at the point in time they were doing recruitment, I said, you know what, I want to be a part of this thing. And I so I did. And so in going into the musical band, Basically, for the primary purpose of ministry, I was exposed to so much within, I wouldn't say the music industry, but some music in itself, like your acts, right? So we had to definitely learn how to read music. We had to definitely learn how to play music because it's a marching band. And we eventually evolved into a concert band, a sitting band. So that would have been my first introduction, which has been a part of the Pathfinder band. I went in as a recruit. And now today I'm one of, well, I am the lead drummer and the um, drum, drum major of the band. So yeah, it, it was, wow. an amazing, it is an amazing journey. Nice. Who has been your biggest influence? Well, the thing is, I have a lot of different influences for different things. But the, the constant for me would always be good. When it comes to the music industry, I would say a lot of the women, there's not one particular person but a lot of women, I surround myself with a lot of women and I network and I engage with a lot of women who are very driven. You know, they have that thirst for knowledge and they have that drive. Those are things and people who encourage me, if not on a daily basis, 
frequently and I'm very, very thankful for that. They influence me in a major way. People like yourself, Dominique, because they keep it pushing me. You as well. Did you always want a career, the career that you have? And if Absolutely. not, what did you want to do? Absolutely not. I think like I always said that I, ha- I stumbled into the music business and even outside of the music business, the actual job that I have, that was no, that was actually one of the jobs where I said I could never do. But I'm in, I'm in the position. God saw it, but I always say that he is a God of humor because I mean like, really? <laughs> so I never saw myself being a music business consultant. Definitely not. I did see myself as a radio personality. Like when I was seven and eight, I was like, why these people on the radio always have a good vibe? Why is they always so happy? Like I want to be a radio personality, you know? And then going into secondary school, I thought about becoming a teacher, which I still really want to be for like secondary school students. And then I thought about being a lawyer, but that was because I was watching um, Soul Food so much and I was heavily influenced by the lawyer <laughs> movie. And then I was like, nah, that's not for me. But yeah, I really want to become a teacher and a really personality. But I actually love the position I'm in right now. So I thank God for that. <laughs> How long have you had a career in music or in the music industry? In the music industry, this year, 2022, would actually make it seven years. Seven beautiful nice. years. Yes. Right. Name one challenge that you encountered in the industry and how did you overcome it or how are you overcoming it? Okay, I would say being in the music industry locally, I remember when I started, because I started at the age of uh, 23 going on 24, and coming into the industry at that point in time, I recognized I was very, very young. I was female, right? And uh, I didn't see much of that. Being black, female, and uh, young is almost like, yeah, in the music industry. So a lot of persons didn't pay me attention, pay me attention. You know, they didn't give me that respect at that point in time. Because I mean, who is this young girl? But again, what stood out for me was my work ethic went before me, right? So persons saw my work before they associated with the face. So persons came and they were asking, well, who is the person behind this? Like, who would have done this? And then when they see the face, they was like, okay then you know because they didn't expect a female they didn't expect somebody so young to be managing and executing these events and working with these artists at that point in time so how i overcame it at the point in time i was working in a ministry that was my job at that point in time and my director at the point in time she always used to stay say what people think about you is not your business that's one Hmm. try your best not to take things personal and i just adapted and i just kind of applied that to myself within the music business like on a general but within the music business and things just became easier and i became more focused on me and to just bar off all the naysayers and with time the respect came the attention came you know and uh, you know basically when you think and you, you drink your water and you mind your business and you, you flourish on yourself <laughs> everything else falls in line you know so that's how i deal with it and continue to deal with it because i'm now confident as to whom who whom i i am you know so yeah, yeah. what is your favorite food food oh, my favorite food fun fact about me I, I born I was born and I grew in a beautiful island of Tobago, right? Let, let's start right there. <laughs> so my favorite food still to this day is a really good dumpling and stew chicken with some lentil peas. And if I if I'm not really feeling the dumpling because I'm listening down on the floor right now, give me some good provision and stew chicken and I roll it. Don't give me a good dumpling and stew chicken and I get two more questions. What? aspect of your daily routine do you look forward to the most oh that does that's definitely some devotion time for sure for sure that's when it's most quiet for me 
that's the time where I can hear my the most. That's when I can actually hear the word of God and where I can really like seek truth and to uh, affirm the promises that he would have given to me. So that's my favorite time. I look forward to that every morning because I don't say that I want it, I need it. Because I know during the day, things are going to happen. I'm not sure what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. So I need to seek him every day to make sure that I am covered and that to make sure that I represent him in the best way possible during the day. That's my daily bread and that's my favorite part to look forward to each and every day. I don't know how people do without it, but I need it. <laughs> and last question, artist, creative, artist, what would you tell them? I have so much to tell them. But based on what I've been seeing lately, based on what I'm reading, out of, I would say to all musicians and artists, seek, try your best to carry yourself as a business. And in addition to that, it is key, it's important that you brand yourself good enough so that you transcend through generations. And when you think about your favorite artist, right? or somebody from the past like michael jackson that's when you create such a strong brand that you transcend through generations where the generation before me know him very well well and the tra and the generation after me they also are going to know him very well because his brand is that strong so for persons to remember you for persons for your music career to flourish it's those are some important things. One, see yourself as a business and to build a very strong brand. Nice. Thank you so much for joining us, Sophia. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. My name is Laurelie Lackies and I am a personal brand coach, publicist and speaker. And today I am going to walk you through my little journey about how I became a personal brand coach and how I can help you create your legacy. So let's begin. How did this little girl at eight years old with her fashionable hat and cute bangs become me? The person that quite a few creatives and women turn to when they need help building their personal brand. What happened in my story that allowed me to be that person? Well, I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, living the typical Caribbean lifestyle, going to the beach, hiking, fishing, sweating. But I wanted more. I had a bigger dream. I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be on stage and I wanted to help people. So I did something about it. I moved to New York City. I went to school and I was going to get a real job. Yep, I was going to get a real job. So I studied psychology because psychologists help people. So I thought that's how I can help. So I studied psychology and I left college. And guess what I did? I ended up working in the New York City fashion scene for about eight years. I was in advertising, marketing, branding. As you can see, some of the companies I was at, Avon, Sony Music, Ralph Lauren, Condé Nast. Yes, the building with Vogue. And yes, I did walk on the Vogue floor and it is amazing. So I did that for a while. And what happened was... I learned everything about branding. This is where my schooling really started. I learned about product development and values and strategy and marketing and styling and the whole trajectory of what happens when you're building a brand. Little did I know that I would be using it later on in life, but I learned everything from product development, fashion, photography, styling, copywriting, PR, media, all the different facets of what it really takes to build a brand. And it was exciting and exhilarating and it never felt like a day at work. I was living the New York City dream. I would walk down these streets feeling vibrant and refreshed and renewed and just unstoppable. Life was great. Life was great until one day 
I had a massive life-changing event or events, I should say. The 2008 crash happened in New York City and everyone was getting laid off, including myself at seven months pregnant. And I didn't know where was I gonna go. And then my marriage crumbled. And I found myself a single mother in New York City with no job. So I packed up. I packed up, I left my dream and I moved back to Trinidad with my son and I lived with my parents, which any of you will know, living with your parents after being away for 15 years was not fun. So I was determined to get myself together and get back on track. So what did I do? Healing work, therapy, crying, journaling, and then I got into action. I sent out my resume. I went to networking events. I said yes to every single thing, free or paid. I just need to get myself out there. I needed to find me again. And I did. I became a voiceover actor. I worked for one of the top event companies in Trinidad and Tobago. And I produced my biggest event to date, Le Diniabla, the all white pop-up picnic, which was my baby for a year and a half. But then I realized I'm doing all of this for someone else. It's time to take a chance on me. And I did. I started L3 Creative. L3 because I have three L's in my name, Laura Lee Lackies. That's my office <laughs> in a broken down building um, with a little broken down desk, but I was doing it. It was mine. And I didn't have much clients in the beginning. I was calling, I was trying to get th this and that. And then all of a sudden doors started to open. I started to work with some really big brands. I started to do some big events. You can see some of them here and it was going really well. And I was like, this is good. I'm on a wave, but I need to do more. And then I started expanding and I opened more doors to myself. I became an announcer on Hot 93 and then another radio announcer on 95. I got press. I got my own TV show on TV6. I said yes to every opportunity. I wasn't afraid of hard work and I knew how to craft my personal brand to make myself sellable. I knew branding. So what happened? People came to me and said, how were you able to do X, Y, and Z for yourself in a short space of time? And can you help me? And so I did. I started personal brand coaching, but I didn't call myself that, but that's what I was doing. All these women and creators would come to me and I was creating more months. And then Music Titi came and we created another moment together. Laura Lee, would you create a personal branding workshop for our artists? Um, yes, Music Titi, I will. I accepted the challenge. But where's my music background, you see, if I was in fashion? Well, I grew up in a musical family. My grandfather was a musician and a producer and he was one of the first producers of Mighty Sparrow and that is a picture with him and a guy from Warner Brothers who actually came to sign my grandfather but he said he did it for the love not the money but artists you need to do it for the money and for the love it's about making money anyway here is my group of beautiful artists and we went through this journey together of helping them build their personal brands how do you position yourself to create opportunities for yourself. I was able to do it for myself. And now my passion is teaching and guiding others to do the same. If I can do it for myself, you can do it for yours. You can create your legacy. All you need to do is believe in yourself. I believe in you. Thank you so much. My name is Laura Lee Lackies. If you want some help on personal branding, feel free to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all the great stuff. Hi, Janae. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Dominique. How are you? I'm good. All right. So for those who don't know, tell us a bit about Janae. What does Janae do? Okay. So my name is Janae Carter and I am the owner of Genka Management. So this is an arts management business. So I specialize in basically like artist booking, stage management, social media management, administrative services, creative production management, and 
artist laser services as well. Nice. All right. So we're getting ready to start our rapid fire segment. Are you ready? Yes, I am. So how long have you had a career in music? Well, my career officially started in 2017 when I became the admin assistant to Nyla Blackman. While at this time, I did not think of starting a business in this field, it kind of opened my mind to new possibilities. Nice. What's the most embarrassing thing that has ever happened to you in public? Okay, so I don't think I've had many embarrassing things happen to me in public. However, I remember in primary school, my dad was a teacher there and I was speaking while he was teaching my class. And he called me up to the front of the class and gave me a cocktail and I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? <laughs> oh my gosh, that is really embarrassing though. All right, name a challenge that you have encountered in the industry. How did you overcome it? Okay, so one challenge I think that I've encountered is not knowing how and when to set boundaries. So when I first came into the industry, I was very inexperienced and naive. And uh, I thought I was superwoman, so anybody who asked for help, I would try to help them. I would think that I can do everything. To overcome this challenge, I had to hold myself accountable. I had to say, okay, well, you are contributing to this. And because of this, you are now being unproductive. Because obviously, if you're trying to do everything in one, you'll be counterproductive, right? Correct. Yeah, that's powerful. All right. If money were no object, what would you do with your life? I think I would be traveling the world, meeting new people and experiencing different cultures. Nice. What is your favorite food? Oh gosh, I love food and I'm very simple. So anything Creole, you could catch me with. Like, I really like homemade soup, like baji rice and those, those kinds of things, yeah. Yeah. Vibes, vibes. What is one important skill that you think everyone should have and why? I think that everyone should have the skill of critical thinking. Only because, you know, being able to identify, analyze, reason, be open-minded, respect different points of views before being, before, sorry, before making unbiased decisions can prove to be fruitful in this life, especially in the diverse and progressive world that we're living in right now. What aspect of your daily routine do you look forward to the most? I would say I look forward to praying and reading. I think that once I begin my day doing either of these things, it kind of recenters my energy before I take on any daily task. Nice. What advice would you give to aspiring female musicians, artists, or any females coming up in the industry? Okay, so while staying true to yourself and your craft is normally the usual, usual advice given, I would say to work on your personal development. You no, know, like being professional, being disciplined, Caring about yourself in a specific manner is very important. Like you could be the most talented person on this earth, but if you are, for example, indisciplined, always late, unreliable, amongst many other things, people will find it difficult to work with you and invest in your career. Correct. What would you say is probably the hardest part of the job? The hardest part of my job is being patient, tolerant, and understanding while dealing with so many different personalities and egos. Like sometimes situations might happen where I am pushed to my limits, but I always have to keep an open mind and think critically on how to get past that obstacle while also remaining professional. How do you cope with work-related stress or anxiety? Well, I think I cope well under pressure in my work life, not personal, <laughs> in my work life. So like if a situation comes up that needs some immediate attention, I would just apply my critical thinking skills and figure it out. If it's something that I can deal with later on, I will take a step back and attempt it at a later time. What is your favorite part of the job? My favorite part of the job will be meeting new people, learning new things, and working with the youth. I always believe that life is a learning journey. It doesn't matter how qualified or experienced you are, there's always something to learn. I also love the fact that I can inspire and positively impact a younger person by just simply being a mentor. Nice. Tell us one goal that you still want to achieve. One of my big goals is obtaining my PhD by the age of 35. Nice. And if you could go back in time and have a do-over, what would you do differently? I kind of want to say a, a few things, but I would say nothing because I feel like every single thing that I've been through and faced in this life has molded me into the woman that I am right now. If I didn't face those things, I don't think I would have been this resilient today. And the last question, three words that you would tell your younger self if you could. I would say patience, faith, 
and open-mindedness. Nice. Thank you very much for joining us. No problem. I'm happy to be here. <laughs>